my talk is not so um, uh, technical because I always I don't know exactly how much technical I should go into with these talks because people sometimes are like, okay, so I talked a bunch of like weird code and no one understands. Yeah, yeah, and uh, I'm glad that finally here I can like go uh, more deeper into stuff. So yeah, what secure by design means? Uh, thanks to Wikipedia, uh, secure by design, basically in software engineering, means that the software products and capabilities have been designed to be foundational secure. And I think um, everyone understands why in blockchain this is important, right? Because uh, like security, it's our first. Um, I, I, if I, if, if I can tell, like, when you wake up in the morning and start programming, I know a smart contract or stuff like that, you first need to think about the security and then about how you create it. Why? Because most of the time, those smart contracts end up having uh, basically deal with some assets that uh, are worth something. Cool. Um, how did you get into Web3? We, most of us basically uh, previously we were in web 2 right and uh, i've seen this a lot in uh, in um, in product in pro in product devs out there uh, they cannot uh, comprehend what exactly web 3 means and they still think and develop their products using their web 2 mind and uh, i wrote just some simple like differences uh, your server has public access right what does it mean right well your database is the blockchain, so everyone can actually look at it, crawl your data. It's not like, okay, I can put my password here. If this, this variable is private. It means that, okay, my password is private here. No, that's not true. So everything in, in the blockchain is basically uh, in, uh, let's say in Ethereum. I'm not talking about okay, Z, uh, ZK and the, the other like types of uh, blockchains that may introduce some, uh, some uh, security and privacy to the data. But right now, the state of the blockchain, uh, kind of like whole, the whole blockchain is, is private. Um, basically, it's hard to, to almost impossible to upgrade, right? Once you deploy your smart contract, kind of that's it. You can actually do much to it. It depends how much you can do. Uh, previously, in Web2, you could basically debug and modify in production if you wanted, and that's not a possibility right now. Uh, in uh, in blockchain, I mean, it is possible using proxies. I'll, I'll talk about it a bit uh, in the in the next slides, but that's something else. And you have a limited computational power, right? In Web two, okay, in nine, uh, nineteen, maybe you kind of like had also uh, a limited computational power. But right now, with the power of cloud, you just put more machines in Web two, and oh, it's it's okay. I don't need to worry about memory about what. Uh, I just put another EC two machine in AWS, and I'm and I'm fine. Well, in the blockchain space, it's not like that. You are basically bounded by the blog gas limit, so you cannot actually go with your computation so 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 much, right? Of course, a lot of languages here to develop smart contracts. Uh, I've put move because people ask me to put move. I don't like move, but it's okay. Uh, uh, yeah, and a lot, a lot of languages uh, that you can write these smart contracts. I. I mean, don't need to enter in details which one each we uh, which we do most of our programming. So we are mostly EVM. Uh, ah, I did not tell you about Sovinator, but I will tell you at the final. Sorry, I'm just ent I entered directly into the problem. Uh, yeah, so uh, we do most of our smart contract development in Solidity and Assembly. You will uh, we worked a bit with the others, but we are not experts, so we don't. Uh, I I won't talk about uh, about them because I mean it's just my uh, one of my uh, philosophies that um, I first need to start and learn how to build on that platform, and then I should start and learn the other way to build on that platform, right? So if I know how to build in Solidity, uh, there are multiple stuff that I need to understand first about Solidity, and then go into you know half Viper or whatever uh, I can build on EVM specific chains. Of course, Rust. Uh, other chains moving up to Sui and the whole uh, Facebook uh, team. Um, now, whenever I talk about developing a smart contract, and I'm talking, of course, about uh, big smart contract, I mean, a, a big protocol, not like a, I don't know, a, a small smart contract, right? Like an NFT contract, okay, 
you cannot i mean maybe you you don't need to adhere to all of these rules but i'm talking about uh, you know, big big protocols we work many protocols that have, have 20 and more smart contracts interact with billions of um, uh, worth of assets so that's that's another thing that i mean it's another mindset that you should have there um first of all is that the business logic needs to understand that you don't build this for um, web 2 you build this for web 3 web 3 means that decentralization most of the time it's the if you can call it like that is the <laughs> uh, mantra that we all uh, let's say uh, try to to follow so the business logic must first account for decentralization it needs to make sure that okay i'm in a decentralized environment again my public uh, my uh, data is public and so on and so forth you cannot for example build right now uh, uh held um, on a public blockchain you cannot be like a, uh, a healthcare app right because you cannot put data that it's basically patient data on on um on the blockchain because it's public right um know your underlying vm and as uh, our colleagues also talked about previously sharding or sharding so you need to know a bit about your underlying vm where you develop your smart contract for right that's kind of like every blockchain had their own um their own particularities uh, and you need to know exactly what you are building for right you build on ethereum okay previously was ethereum 1.0 or whatever how we can call it that they were, we, we want to call it uh, block time was an uh, was an issue it, it wasn't like uh it didn't have kind of like a pattern right right now in 2.0 it's hard coded to 12 seconds so that's something that you should think and should know about right uh i don't know there are other like vms uh, about it. Uh, the multiverse uh, vm it's sharding so you need to understand uh, uh, the caveat and what what implications you have when you build on multiverse and so on and so forth it's very important to understand this under uh, underlying uh, asset right you have of course the, all the roll-ups and so on and so forth with the block times like two seconds or stuff like that other problems there um most of the small guys are for uh, that are forking and i like to call them the forkers uh, there are forking protocols they don't understand all of this stuff and they just okay uh, this protocol was built for uh, ethereum and now they de de deploy it on orbit from nova which is two second block time your whole timestamp logic it's useless right now because right now it it, 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 it it's, it's way different so yeah you need to know your uh your underlying vm uh, of course uh, keys uh and i will talk about keys a bit uh, later on and the uh, the last one test 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 this is something that i cannot uh, i don't know uh, i never stop telling to the developers to the business uh, owners and so on and so forth that you need to test you cannot rush a product like on the blockchain into production uh yeah yeah that enters into the test part okay right uh business logic right uh, what the, uh, i'm going i will go through through all of them right business logic what it means well when you analyze it from the business logic point of view you have to think a bit about okay what third parties i'm integrating with are they safe or not uh, very important right uh, do i know with whom i'm integrating and the simplest example right yeah i want to integrate my protocol to be integrated with uniswap well you need to basically know about that and you need to understand exactly what that means what uniswap means and uh, and so on and so forth right uh does this business logic work for a blockchain project that's something also that i oh, ask my our clients like okay do you want to build on blockchain because you got money using blockchain or do you want to build on blockchain because it actually fits to be on a blockchain because <laughs> uh, depending on that answer you also know how to approach the client and you know how to create your app right if you just build it on the project as you raised an ico with or whatever a few millions okay that's something that we understand and we build on it but if it's that something that actually fits to be on a blockchain then yeah that's a different thing vm I, as, I, as i said a bit about the vm so we have multiple uh, types of vms i didn't pull the multiverse one sorry <laughs> uh yeah uh you need to understand them you need to make sure that you uh, you are aware of them and when you build on a, a most of the time maybe your pr protocol is built on multiple chains so it has multiple uh, uh it interacts with multiple under uh, underlying vm so you need to make sure that of that as well the logic changes 
how you interact with with that uh, VM also changes and so on and so forth. So you need to be very, very uh, aware of that. Uh, of course, the case principle, which is something that you should always follow. Um, people sometimes try to build Facebook home uh, in the blockchain. Like they try to complicate it so much. They think that the smart contract, it's basically, a, I don't know, a server or I know it's like their, their, their app which is very, very uh, wrong. Uh, I always say, keep it simple. Never go, never try to complicate it. Never try to build the microservice architecture on the blockchain, because that's not work, right? Uh, that means, okay, the number of smart contracts, how, do I, how, do, how many smart contracts do you need to, uh, to, to create? Uh, do you know the number? Do you actually did the uh, smart contract architecture to know exactly how they interact? Um, and so on and so forth, right? Uh, do I need to interact with an Oracle? Do I need off-chain data? How do I get that off-chain data to the chain? Uh, a big a big problem from web two to web three is that, okay, you cannot access any type of data, right? And if you like, I don't know, post from Facebook on, on, uh, on the blockchain, it's not that simple. You need to interact with an Oracle. What that means? You need that, that not, it's not a trustable uh, party, so it can actually put you some bad data there and so on and so forth. Uh, and this is important uh, also. Do I need them to be upgradable? Upgradability, I mean, this is kind of like a big, big talk in, in blockchain. Upgradability can be a bug, not a feature. What it means, it means that if you don't know how to upgrade your smart contract, it can actually uh, be very bad for uh, for you. And for those who build and maybe interacted with Solidity and proxies and so on and so forth, we know that one of the biggest, biggest issue is actually um, storage collisions and people don't know about that and they end up actually having uh, uh end up in a bad situation that you kind of like sometimes cannot uh, uh cannot go out of uh, an important question uh, does it needs any centralization like do you need any centralized party to i don't know i don't know what that means centralization i need a wallet that can submit i know that can call something uh, why that's important? Well, it's important because if you introduce any centralization, the centralization is a risk. It's a security risk as well as uh, your smart contract is a security risk if it's not built correctly, right? And I will talk a bit about that in the uh, next. Uh, uh, ACL, basically, the access control list, the whole access control list strategy is very important. And it's one of the biggest, um, not, not getting into much detail right now, but it's one of the biggest issues out there. And probably you guys know that a lot of problems are, uh, happen at at the access level, right? And of course, test, 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 <laughs> test, test, test. Yeah, I put it. I put everything here. So you should do all types of testing, like unit testing, formal verification, invariant testing, fuzzing, integration, uh, integration testing. All, all, all of this, all of this. Why? Well, of course. The biggest, the biggest question that I get here is okay, but we don't have money for all of this. What do we do? <laughs> what do we do is that try to try to hit most of them try to hit most of them I, I mean for the first two i think you should be able to do it without a very big budget uh for the next ones are a bit of like okay are a bit more work to do on them and you need to actually specialize them to do a correct fuzzing to run the fuzzer for days not for one second uh i heard like protocols big, big out there that they found bugs after running the fuzzer for two months. Like, so that's like a very edge case bug, right? If you run the fuzzer for uh, I know, an hour, may not be enough. Uh, yeah, uh, the invariant testing, formal verification. Again, you need a lot of preparation there. And as also my colleagues talked a bit uh, uh, previously, it's, I mean, it's nice. And of course, a, a protocol of multivest maybe can do that, but when I, when I talk with customers that like, aren't that like tech savvy, they're like, what do we need this? Like, well, well, form of, well, no, no, I just need to deploy. Uh, it's not that simple. Okay, you can deploy the first version, but you know, if you're, uh, uh, I, and, and they, they all say this, oh yeah, but when I reach 100 millions in TVL, I will do this. And okay, but you know, that can happen overnight and then the form of ver verification cannot happen overnight. That That's a, a, a lengthy process, right? Yeah, it's um, uh, it's managed, but yeah, these should be all part of your development. 
uh, process. And if you interact and if you create smart contracts, make sure that you reach as many as you can from this, uh, uh, from this, uh, let's say, uh, testing uh, approaches. Do I have ten? Still have ten? Okay, I still have ten. Okay, awesome. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. So learn from the past mistakes, right? Uh, one thing that probably uh, if you are on Twitter and you actually spend a lot of time on Twitter as me, uh, this issue uh, doesn't look so good, but it is what it is. So we have here the uh, Euler finance uh, bug that happened, exploit that happened uh, previously. And one thing that was important here to notice that they, they did a, a, an audit with Sherlock which is a kind of like a decentralized uh, auditing company. And uh, they, everyone was like, oh, they were audited. Oh, Sherlock is shit. What? Why? Why they didn't find it, right? Well, it's not like that. Audits are gold, but are, they are not a diamond. I mean, they, they don't tell you, if you don't audit, doesn't mean that you are 100% sure. Actually, nothing tells you that you are 100% sure, right? No, all of these, all of these help you increase your percentage of being safe but they, they will never tell you, yeah, it's 100% uh, sure. Another thing that is important here, this is from reg.news, is that probably, this is top 10, right? This is basically top 10 hacks in the blockchain, blah, blah, blah. Uh, latest ones, not the whole, I say, uh, I don't know, uh, Bitconnect or whatever was in the past, right? Um, we have the Ronin network, which is basically the Axie Infinity hack. This was a Web2 hack, it wasn't a Web3 hack hack the the keys of their uh, uh, of their uh, uh, validators managed to basically validate the uh, the uh, withdrawal of i think 60 yeah uh, uh, 600 millions web to hack uh, poly network i uh, i will talk this uh, about this in the uh, next slides what's important here to notice is that most of these aren't audited right Okay, audits are, are, are gold, but not diamond, but that doesn't mean that you should not have them. Like It's important at least to have them because if you don't have them, you make the job of the exploiter very easy, basically. Ah, and uh, here is the CBF one. I'm not sure it's, it's here, but you kind of like cannot do anything here on the FTX and the whole. That's mostly our governance job, not our job. Uh, yeah, so Web2 uh, versus Web3, right? Web2 security is important. These two were all uh, hacked because of the Web2 bugs, right? Running, leaked keys, uh, the key management system was not as should be probably uh, the keys were like on a VM or stuff like that kept there and the attacker just basically maybe brute for the SS agent and entered into the VM or something. Uh, Bitmart, I think was kind of like the same, they hacked some uh, wallets and they drain the wallets or stuff like that, right? Yeah, 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 exactly. And, uh, and the attacker shorted them and they took all the money. Yeah. So nobody figured out what the spread went off. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you, you no, had a, but... ah, yeah, yeah, uh, exactly. So Web2, right? They didn't have a... So, Six, uh, 600 millions are basically out of your pocket and you don't didn't even, didn't even notice for six days. Monitoring at its best, basically, right? Yeah. The, and I think a user or something discovered and they tried to withdraw and it's a, I get an error, I cannot withdraw. Ah, we don't have money. <laughs> ah, okay, nice. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, web 2 security is very important. Something that, again, people are focusing on audits on, on the solidity and they think that's fine i'm safe now i can release my protocol well not quite web3 is also important you have your dub also on aws your aws gets hacked your dub basically your smart contracts behind your dub gets replaced with malicious smart contracts and then again people are approving blah 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 and so on and so forth a lot of things can happen. Think about OpenSea. But what happens if someone hacks OpenSea servers? I think not something. Okay, maybe, maybe let's say, okay, let's not talk about the signatures and so on and so forth that they can use and basically probably steal all the NFTs. But let's say if OpenSea gets hacked and someone just replaced the OpenSea interface with another OpenSea interface that looks exactly the same but has other contracts, probably a lot of people will uh, lose their ETH from their wallet, right? uh yeah 
that was all, yeah, that was all here. So come on, ah, I, I make this in, the, this morning because I was kind of busy, so sorry for not being so prepared. Uh, common mistakes, right? Uh, thanks to uh, ChatGPT, I uh, managed to get this nice, uh, nice metaphor. So writing secure code is like constructing a fortress, right? Every wall, every gate, and every defense mechanism must be meticulously crafted and fortified to prevent even the most determined intruders from penetrating its defenses. And that basically your exploiter is waiting at, um, for your mistake, right? And I will talk a bit now about the common mistakes. I cannot believe that even today after the DAO hack 2015 or 16, when that was, we still have people who, and we, we also do some sort of like smart contract audits with other partners and so on and so forth. Uh, I think we did over 30 or 40 smart contract audits so far. Uh, big protocols, not uh, small protocols. Uh, not like uh, runtime verification, Unisap, and so on and so forth, but still, still, uh, still uh, big. Um, and we, we discovered this a lot, right? Checks effects interaction. It's a pattern that in a smart contract development, uh, uh, smart contract development uh, developer, sorry, should always uh, follow it. What it means, it, it's a very simple pattern which tells some simple steps, right? You first do the checks, then you do the interactions, then you have the effects. No, you first do, you first do the check, then do the effects, then do the interaction. Why? Because it's pretty simple. Smart, smart contracts communicate uh, between them, right? But they communicate in the same transaction, so you, they can all call each other, blah, 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 right? Well, the problem is that whenever this interaction happens, this is, this is called an external call, right? This external call can basically ruin your protocol, right? And again, DAO hack and all of those hacks, probably most of those in the top 10 also are, are part of that. If you do this, which is completely wrong, you can re-enter at this line and execute it over and over again and do basically a re a recursion and uh, do all sorts of stuff. Here should have been a withdrawal method. I didn't know that. It's, the quality is not so good, sorry. But here, basically, it's a withdrawal method that basically, when the attacker enters here, withdraws all the balance from the contract, and then the balance of the messenger sender is zero, right? The effects of the interaction are done after the, the interaction, so the attacker could re-enter into that point. So we still have problems with this. And I always tell you, respect checks, effects, interaction is very important in all our audits. I think we at least put this to medium uh, as, a, like, as a severity. And it's very important. Why? Because people need to understand this is very, very important. There is another thing here. People think that, okay, I, uh, I'm not respecting checks, effects, interaction. I'm, put, I'm putting a re-entrance guard, then I'm safe. Interesting guard basically tells me now all the problems that you told me about reentrancy uh, re and so on and so forth are uh, uh, are solved now. Well, there are multiple types of reentrancy. It's not only reentrancy in the same function right, at the function level. So as I as I showed you here, right here it at, at the function level. So you can reenter in just within this function. But there are multiple types of reentrancy. You you can have cross functions reentrancy. This also, most of the time, it's also uh, uh, take, uh, it's, it's uh, a re interesting guard basically uh, can help you with that as well. But we have cross contrast re interesty. And last but my, not least, and my favorite is the read only re interesty, which is a thing that wasn't kind of like a thing till uh, curve uh, pools got exploited using this uh, read-only reentrancy is something that is hard to actually see and debug and understand uh, but it's something that it happens and uh, yeah read-only reentrancy it's uh, it's shit um, but the idea is think bigger right don't think only at the function level right Think about the whole protocol. Think about the third party that you interact uh, with. Think about everything and who can re-enter and why you should always try to respect checks, effects, interaction and always try to avoid all of this, right? 
I'm not entering into interest what they mean and so on and so forth because you probably Google is more smarter than me. Uh, least privileged principle. It's a very important, and I was I was saying about the ECLs. We we still have. I mean, this is a big big problem. Access control and who has access to what methods. Uh, it's very very um, important to understand actually to think about it from the beginning. Uh, and so we say that we see of course in public in in our smart contracts our auditing. We have the first one which basically okay this is like. No, 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 no one like okay. If you have a public function that access data that shouldn't access, like a, a withdrawal function is a public, then okay, that's uh, that's your fault. But then the the most ugly ones are the third parties who can actually enter and have access. And uh, two minutes, okay, awesome. Uh, I, I talked a lot. Um, and the, the, the third parties that are accessing and uh, having access to functions and so on and so forth that they shouldn't. Uh, and all very important unrevoked roles. Like you do, you actually did put some roles to to to, to, I don't know, to a party, and then that party is not active anymore, and you forgot to unrevoke the roles. And after uh, a year, the party like wakes up and oh, hmm, I have some roles here. Huh? Let me see uh, if I still have them. And you probably they still have it. Uh, and of course, of course, of course, edge case testing. I'm reiterating, reiterating again about testing. When you, de when you develop your protocol, 99% uh, of the flows usually work. The 1% that you don't test, those are usually that don't work. So yeah, edge case testing, like unbounded arrays, not counting for the blow gas limit, not considering any flash loans. I think that wasn't kind in the past, but flash loans are very bad. So these are very, very important. I talked a bit about oracles. Don't trust your Oracle. Some mistakes like stale data or incorrect data, and especially when like when you know uh, FTX goes down and the prices are going up and down, your Oracle probably will tell you some incorrect data there. And here are some stats. So again, sorry for the weird uh, uh, pixelation, but I can tell you here, here is where it should be. Basically, in 2020, access control. Uh, flash loans, the reentrancy are still in top, like most of, uh, let's say, uh, uh, hacks and exploits that happened in 2020. Okay, we have others, we have Rockpools, which basically we cannot do anything about them. Uh, but access control, flash loans, and reentrancy are still in top, which is quite bad, if you ask me. And I think that's all. I spoke too much. Right. Any uh, questions? Questions. I told I thought I did not have enough time. <laughs> yeah, but I uh, for like real, <laughs> real blockchain right now that's yeah, kind of like not happening. Oh, you said you were going to say. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah. So yeah. Vineta Technologies, yeah, I've been in business for uh, ten years. Uh, five years in blockchain, build, doing a lot of smart contract development and all types of like development. We do Web2 and Web3, uh, specialized on Web3 and EVN specific, and that's it. We develop smart contracts for clients or yeah, for your for clients, for clients, yeah. And also we built uh, some tooling for the for the community as well, like I don't know, for sets and stuff like that. If I may add, uh, one thing that we found very useful is to formalize not the code, not to formally verify the code necessarily, but to formalize the business logic of yeah. the protocols. Yeah. Come up yeah. with formal models of the business logic. Because that informs you of the properties that you want to check against the code. Yeah. And then auditors, even if they don't use formal verification tools, they at least know what to look for. And they find lots of errors at that level, yeah. not at the business logic level. Exactly. One of the important things is here that the devs understood something, and the business logic, it's exactly some, uh, it's something else. And the dev understood and implemented in their, in their way. The business team doesn't know to read the code, so the business doesn't know how to say, ah, yeah, you did it correctly. And the formal verification of that also tells the auditors a lot of, uh, of uh, important stuff, yeah. It's very hard to find errors that uh, you don't look for yeah. <laughs> in code, uh, even when you do formal verification. So having yeah. a business logic model allows you then to drive the formal verification tools with a goal in mind and you discover other bugs like reentrancy or yeah. other bugs you just discover them by checking other problems <laughs> which is yeah. nice which is awesome all right somebody question logic is 
formalized? Is it formalized logic or is you use the name logic? Uh, no, business logic is using the business sense, but when you formalize it, use an underlying logic. Uh -huh. That's a formalism, but the point is to come up with a rigorous model of, um, of what your protocol is supposed to be, like a specification of your protocol. Mm -hmm. Okay. And that put in, into nice words, basically let you formalize it and uh, formal verify, verify it very easy. Yes, that's what we do actually. <laughs> Most, half of our revenue comes from that formalizing business logics. Yeah. I think K is the yeah. one to be yeah. okay. And not only us, others as well. But you have to know and ask for that as a client. Oh, yeah, exactly. We try to educate our clients <laughs> as much as we can. But um, as you said, many of them don't understand the need for formal verification. Yeah. And scare them. Ah, always. Scare yeah. them. <laughs> Actually, I worked <laughs> now, now that we over time anyway. <laughs> so when I worked at NASA between 2000 and 2002, <clears throat> the first thing which shocked me there was that for every single project we worked at, only 20% of the budget of the project went into writing the code. The rest was too. The 80% went into testing, 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 formal verification, formalizing the business logic, analyzing. And nobody tries to hack that code. <laughs> like you put it on a spacecraft and it flies, right? Nobody hacks it. Yeah. But on the blockchain, everybody tries to, to exploit any error. So it should be 90% exactly, in, exactly. in verification. It's, and only 10 percent into writing the code as you could see it, it happens to be in this in this chart then right if you don't do all of this you end up into come on come on, come on this chart right yep exactly Six, exactly 600 millions I mean, that's not a it's easy. scary that 600 millions in the protocol and they, it's not even audited you just have to trust those guys who wrote the code and you have the money right now yeah yeah give six, it's not even better than i would if you're 100 million like Nothing. <laughs> I don't even bother hacking that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's only 100 million. <laughs> okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.